And one of the things that we face is this idea of weariness. Now, if you notice the scriptures very carefully tonight, and go down to verse number nine, and let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and specifically, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Paul introduces the idea of weariness. He brings up that whole thought along the line of trying to encourage the Christians to keep on keeping on in a positive direction. So when we talk about this, we, we have to remind ourselves of who we are. Now, what, what is the church is the question on the table. We have to think about this on a regular basis because it's so easy to miss who we are and what we've been called to be. When we examine this thought, we remember that the church is the, is the spiritual body of Jesus. We know that Jesus took on a human body. We know that he function in that human body for approximately 33 years. We know that about three and a half years, he had an earthly ministry. And then he was crucified, buried, raised, and ascended. And the church is the representation of Christ in this world. He's not here physically, but he is here in the sense of the spiritual body. The church is the household of faith. We are people of faith, and we are people that uphold faith. We, we are those that are to hold true to who Jesus is and what he said and what he taught and, uh, and everything related to that. But not only that, uh, we are the people that have been immersed. This is how we became the church. We, we believed in the saving work of Christ. We made our commitment of turning away from known sin. Uh, and we had a desire to have whatever our past sins were forgiven. And that's why we were immersed in water. This is how we became a part of the household of God, of the spiritual body. And then never forget that we are a community of saved sinners. That's not a contradictory statement. You and I are not to practice sin as a profession. The NBA playoffs are going on. Those guys are professionals. They practice all the time and they're practicing their craft. When we think about this from a spiritual perspective, we are not to practice uh, the craft of sin. Plan it out. Do it. Keep on doing it. That's not the path of a child of God. If that is the path, then we, we never really got serious about Jesus. But we are saved sinners in that even as we strive daily to avoid, to stay away from sinful behavior in word and thought and deed, we do sin. The Bible lets us know about that. Second, I'm um, rather first John chapter one uh, and read the first and second chapter and you'll see that. But we're stay, we're still saved. So that, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. It's not as if the Lord has tossed us aside. It, it's not as if the Lord has said, all right, you messed up and uh, I have nothing else to do with you. We're not living under law. <laughs> we're, we're not living in that situation. We're living under the economy of grace. Grace says you, you get another chance. Notice I said another chance, not a second chance, another chance. The Lord doesn't sit in heaven and count on his fingers. All right, Brown, that's the third strike you out. Uh, no, as long as we are sojourning in this world, we need grace because we certainly need opportunity, chance to get ourselves together again. Uh, to get ourselves going. I remember, and some of you may as well, uh, 
an old Stevie Wonder song called Higher Ground. Now, he sings about reincarnation. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But I am emphasizing a different part of that song. I'm so glad he let me try it, live to try it again. And that's the whole idea. Uh, forgive me, Lord, and, and try me one more time. We are a community of saved sinners. No perfection. No perfection in the church. And we are also, and maybe even because of our being a community of saved sinners, we are a fellowship of people that give care and receive care. It's a two-way street. I need to give care because I need to receive care. I need to give it because I'm going to need it. This is then what the church is. Paul has this in mind when he talks about bearing one another's burdens, but then he drops down in our verses 9 and 10, and he tells us, don't get weary. Don't get weary. Weary of what, Paul? Weary in trying to do the right thing. So this leads us to some other things. What about church life? You've grown up in a family. Whether you've been the single child or whether there were 100 people with you, whatever the family type, you grew up in a family. Uh, most of you know I have four siblings, and uh, we, we grew up in a small house, uh, uh, and our parents were that, and we had cramped quarters. I'm not telling you anything that you probably hadn't experienced yourself. Uh, my brother and I, my, my brothers and I, Slept in bunk beds, one on the top, and then the two younger ones had to sleep together on the bottom. My two sisters had to stay in a, a little room in, the, in, in, in a small bed, and, and we all had to figure out the bathroom schedule, all the kind of stuff you had to deal with. And good graces a lot. You talk about family life, that was family life, along with a whole lot of other things. Well, there's church life too. And in church life, yeah. You got a lot of things that go on. Uh, when we talk about this particular context, we are dealing with the idea of performing service. So when we talk about performing service from this text, we can really wrap it under the umbrella of doing good. And this is the idea that all of us have to be about doing good. We can't just talk about the, the, the goodness of the gospel, and the euangelion is good news. Yeah, but we got to be good news. Uh, you've heard of the movie Bad News Bear. Uh, we don't want to be Bad News Westview. Uh, so we, we have to be about good stuff as well as preach good stuff. Now, the word good here is of new. There are two particular Greek words that uh, come across in English as good. Uh, kalos is the idea of something that's really good to look at, it's pretty to look at, uh, and because it's it's also praiseworthy, you admire it, uh, you say something about it because it, it hit you, it impacted you in a very positive way. Many of us see news stories where someone has done something uh, for another individual and it makes us smile. It gives us a warm feeling because it's a it's a good thing to look at. It's something that's really nice to look at. So when you talk about kalos, it, it is really referring to the ethics behind the action. It's, it's the, the quality of conduct. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 5. You know this verse. Let men see your kalos works, your good works, and because it's so praiseworthy, it, it, it's so good to look at, then they give God glory. And that's what God wants out of us. Uh, the things we do uh, cause him to receive praise. It reflects so well. If you have the fortunate experience of receiving commendation while you were in school, uh, and your parent or parents were allowed to come and ask to come and check you out, you know you couldn't fit your head in the car on the way back. It is a beautiful thing that you 
were commended. But guess what else? Your parent or parents are the ones that really have their chest out because it reflects positively on them. So then this is what God wants. He wants that type of thing happening among his children. Chaos, good. Not, not the idea of neos, a new and point of time, but chaos, a uh, new and point of uh, good, rather, in the sense, not new, I said the wrong thing. Uh, chaos is good in the point of it is something that's beautiful uh, to look at uh, as opposed to Agatha. So, so you have then this idea. So there are two groups of people who are the recipients of our doing good deeds. Two different groups of people. Those that are in the church that we can bless, they ought to be the kind of people that we can bless, we can do things to, for, that allows God to smile and receive glory. And then there are people that aren't in the church, but they're in need. And we can be a blessing to them. Uh, I'm, I'm mind, reminded of uh, Sister Brittany, uh, among many, uh, our Sister Brittany, who is constantly trying to do things uh, that help people who can't help themselves. Uh, and, and, and many of you have done that. I, I just pointed her out because I was thinking about something she did just recently. So there, there are a lot of people in Huntsville who can't help themselves or can barely help themselves. And these are the people that we need to do things that other folks see and say, that's beautiful. That is really beautiful. Man, these, who are these people again? Westview? What are they? Oh, man. Well, and they talk about God. Man, they, they really believe. I, I see it in what they do. And then there are people within the congregation who are in need. And it's a beautiful thing. When we do things that are beautiful to look at, and others can say, wow, you know that these folks are serious about what they're doing. Uh, look what they're doing. Look how they're treating one of their own. So then these are the two categories of people that we need to be a blessing to. And there are two different ways that we can do good. First of all, we can be a blessing to those in the church who Fall. And where am I getting that from? It's right here in the text. The Bible tells us in the first few verses, if anyone is caught in a transgression, anybody caught violating God's word, the people that are spiritual, saying that in a, in a way that we can grasp really easily, those that are really about the things of God, when those individuals restore that man or that woman and they have the right attitude about it, then they are following the spirit that God wants us to have. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a, any transgression, no matter what it is, then you who consider yourself spiritual, what you should do is go to that person and seek to restore that person and do it with the right spirit, a spirit of gentleness. So th this is one specific way of doing good. Be a blessing to the people who fall. And then being a blessing to those who are in and out of the church who need something material. Two different ways that we can follow this teaching in this text. Somebody in the congregation, money is short, need food, need clothes, need medication, uh, on and on it goes. Help them. Help them to get past that need. Supply that want. When I'm saying want, I'm talking about need, right? I'm wanting of something. Supply that. Uh, go in your pocket. Uh, go in your closet. Whatever it takes. To meet that, that's a blessing. But but I think sometimes we we think more about that part of being a blessing to somebody than we do people who who people who mess up. We got to be a blessing to them too. It's easy for me. 
Or perhaps I should say, it's easier for me to reach into my pocket, my closet, you know, whatever, and say, well, look, uh, you need some. I know you do. Here, I'm going to do this because I know you need help. I know you need help, and I want to be a blessing to you. Well, that doesn't really cost me as much. Oh, yeah, I might have an extra pair of shoes. Yeah, it cost me as much. But look at that first bullet. Being a blessing to those in the church who fall, that's going to cost me more. Why is it going to cost me more? Look at verses 1 and 2. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Well, first of all, that's going to cost me some pride. Because the next part of the verse says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So that's going to cost me. Look, I got three pairs of Nikes sitting in the closet, and uh, I don't need them. You know, I haven't worn one of them in five years. And it's still clean and all that, smell good, hardly warm. It ain't going to cost me to give you those. Why? I mean, I don't, and I'm not going to miss those. But if you fall in a sin, and now I'm called upon, since I consider myself spiritual, to restore you, that's going to cost me some pride because I'm going to have to fight this attitude that says, huh, man, you messed up, uh, and I'm better than that. I'm going to have to fight that. That's part of my human nature. I'm going to have to fight that hubris on my part. This is what Paul means when he says, restore him, I'm going to say her as well, restore whichever sex, uh, male or female, got to make sure that's plain, in a spirit of gentleness. I can't come to you on a high horse. Because if I come to you on a high horse, you can be sure that there's going to be a time when I'm going to get hit with a hard wind and find myself in jeopardy of falling as well. This is what Paul says. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so then Two different ways we can do good, which is what we are called to do, to do good. Where's the good coming from in our lesson tonight? Down at verse number nine again. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Well, sometimes it can be wearying to do good. That's the struggle of church life. We can get tired. We can get frustrated. We become weary of doing good. Whether we're talking about helping somebody through a personal issue with their faith because they're slipping or giving somebody something, especially if it's the same person again. All right. Now, some of us have been around for a long time. Uh, and we know we've had brothers and sisters. Uh, in need or something, and, and it's easy to get to that attitude of, and again, didn't we just get you something two weeks ago? Or, or didn't you ask for something last year? What are you doing with yourself? It's easy to fall into that trap. But life has a way. Life has a way. And I believe God ordains it that way of making us eat our words at times. So these words grow weary. Give up. I think the King James Version says faint. Uh, these words are similar in their concept. They, they, they have the idea of fatigue. Uh, I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. I'm exasperated. And we tend to get more exasperated with people than we do circumstances. You know, we get exasperated with circumstances. We do. Some of you left your job today and say, I can't stand this place. I'm quitting tonight. You know, we, we, we get exhausted with circumstances. But the beautiful thing about that, relatively speaking, is it's kind of easy to change your circumstances if you really want to. I work with people, you work with people, they say, man, I'm so sick of this job. And some of us have said, well, you don't have to stay here. And you can change. And you can leave. And here they same person there the next day. So if you got tired enough, you leave. Uh, you can change circumstances easier when it comes to changing people, that's difficult. Because we really can't change people. God has to do that. 
So we have to be patient with the Lord and let him do what he does while we work as an instrument of influence for change. When people in Christ sin, you and I have to work as an instrument to encourage them, to exhort them to get out of that lane and to get in the right lane. This is what Paul was saying to that guy or about that guy in the Corinthian church. Remember the guy that was living with his stepmother as wife? Uh, as long as there was an issue where people were saying, him included, oh, I haven't said, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, yeah, you got to deal with that in a different way, but still love him. But when the man changed, and you read that in the Corinthian letters, if you read them carefully, Paul was saying, look, you can't keep on beating on this dude. You got to let him up from the man. He's trying to get up. Don't keep your foot on his neck. Because if you do, he's going to give up all together. So one thing in terms of changing circumstances or situations, we can kind of do that if it's circumstances, things. Because of people, it's more difficult. We got to be willing to have a spirit that allows God to do the changing while we become the instruments of the change. It, surgeons do their work, those that work their saw, and they do it very well. But they use instruments to get the job done. Scalpel, <laughs> you know, sutures, and, and, and as they do it, they're using the instruments. God works to change people. But he says, Brown, you know, Gordon, Branch, these are the tools he uses to get the job done. So then we have to keep this in mind. Now, this first verb puts emphasis, emphasis on losing interest, right? The idea of growing weary. Uh, sometimes when it's time, if we're called to do good, you can get weary to the point where you don't even care anymore. You can lose interest. Uh, marriages fall apart because folks lose interest. Friendships fall apart because folks lose interest. Uh, this idea of growing weary can be, I, I, I'm out. Yeah, I'm, I'm fatigued. I'm burned out. I, I don't want to be bothered with this anymore. Uh, but then the second verb, uh, give up, puts emphasis on beginning, becoming so discouraged uh, that you... Just, you don't try anymore, right? Uh, I'm discouraged, or I'm checking out. Let somebody else handle it, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, and this is how we get, if we allow ourselves to get this way. So Paul says, look, don't grow weary in doing good. Can church members drive you nuts? Absolutely. But if you think that's true, you can also believe that family members, you know, they've driven you nuts too. Uh, there have been times where I'm sure my parents would have loved to put me over to somebody else's house. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, there's been situations in your house, uh, young years or even today, where you would like to... Uh, kind of see somebody walk out the door and you lock it real quick. We get weary, very weary. We do can become discouraged. It's hard. A parent trying to rear a child who is just with calcitrant and or keeps doing it, it's hard. And yet we can't grow weary in the family of God. Let me tell you something. The only person who has a right to get sick and be done with any of us is the one who calls. You got that right. <laughs> uh, but thank God he doesn't, he doesn't do that with us. So God realizes then that in church life, uh, there are things that can make us tired. There are things that can make us want to quit. Just before I came on with you tonight, I was watching a video from one of the preachers in another congregation, and he, he had a lesson called um, Three Things Your Minister Will Never Tell You. Um, and he was talking about the different things, and uh, 
I just thought it was very pertinent because one of the things I, they resonated with me. And, you know, yeah, you get to the point where you just you just shot, and sadly, a lot of guys just walk away from the pulpit never to return. Well, there are a lot of members who get the same way. We can get weary. Well, let's talk about this in more detail. What what are some things that just make us sick and tired of being sick and tired? What what are what are, what are some examples? Well, uh, we can grow weary when it comes to helping Christians that are faltering. That's the first two verses. So if anyone among you, notice this, is caught in any transgression, think about this. There are some who are sinning uh, and we don't even know about it. So uh, this is talking about if anyone is caught in any transgression. Now let me clarify. Let me clarify this. Listen, you don't become the FBI, right? Uh, you don't snoop around after every brother or sister and see what he or she is doing. That's crazy talk. Uh, the idea here is this brother or this sister is faltering and you you know it. You, you come to see it. Uh, and, and we ought to be perceptive enough. We ought to be perceptive enough where we can start at least getting a smell when things aren't right with the soup. Uh, that doesn't mean being nosy. That means getting to know one another genuinely enough that I can get a hint that, wait a minute, something's not right with you. Uh, that there's something that's not quite smelling right. And you have to even do that with the right spirit. It's more of, uh, I want to do what I can to try to help. And, and are you okay? Uh, I've been noticing, and you know, are you okay? Now, look, you can't do that with somebody who you've never even said hello to, right? You got to build up a relationship to be able to help, or you might you might not even get a true response. So there's relationship building that's involved with this. But we can grow weary in helping faltering Christians. These are the people that deal with moral issues, uh, ethical issues, and other types of things. These are uh, things that we, we keep on dealing with even on the other side of water baptism. You didn't come out of the water and God said, you're so good, let me bring you in heaven right now. Uh, I, I know that's not true. He is not true with me. So people who get caught in transgression are, are dealing with stuff, having already been baptized in Christ. Uh, overtaken is what you have in one translation. It's getting caught up. Uh, Y'all remember Usher, I'm so caught up? Uh, the, the whole idea is we do get caught up. We can get caught up in stuff. Uh, we can get caught underwear. It, it can involve a betrayal. It can involve a deception. Everybody has weak moments. I don't care how long you think or I think we've been wearing our super Christian cape. That's picked the night for all of us. Everybody can fall, everybody can be overtaken. And therefore, uh, Paul makes that statement, you got to consider yourself or get yourself embarrassed by saying, I would never do this. <laughs> In one sense, you never know until the circumstance hits you, right? So that there's a need to be sensitive to. A fellow Christian who gets caught up, gets surprised, by an act of sin, if this happens, the instruction is to cause that fallen person uh, to be in a condition uh, to, to function well. I mess up. You mess up. One of the things we can't do is take the fallen brother or sister and get into our new church building and hang them by the neck off the seat and say, this is what we do to people who messed up. Boy, that's a great way to go to church, isn't it? The, the, the instruction is, yeah, there's wrong. No, you don't excuse wrong. No, you never pass it by. But you learn to have grace to help, to deal with the person because that brother might need some help dealing with something. And 
you, you might need to be more, I might need to be more creative. <laughs> you got a gambling problem, man. You brew all the money again. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to sit there and, and wave my finger at you. But what I might do next time you get paid, I might call you up. And let's hang out, man. Uh, and, and, you know, by the way, since you're going by the bank anyway, uh, let, let's drop this money into this account that your name uh, is not the only one on. And, and we got restrictions on how much you need. Let, let, how the hell? So you don't get caught up again. So it's tempting to be weary, though. It's tempting to get frustrated, to, to get even arrogant in trying to help people who fall. Uh, it, it, it's tempting to say, I'm done with this. Uh, good graces. I've been preaching and ministering, been a minister since I was 17 years old. I, I've told you all this before. Uh, and there have been many of them when somebody comes and, you know, brother, I'm I'm like, my, my, my mind is saying, what? <laughs> Again? <laughs> but, but you got to be careful about that because you never know. You never know. I've encountered some things in my life that I would have never thought I would have encountered or been weak to back several years ago. But life happens. Life happens. Uh, the admonition then is to not grow weary. The maxim of sowing and reaping has to be remembered, right? Uh, look at the text. The text tells us, as we look at these verses, uh, in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. So if you run as you run, even in our congregation, fellow Christians, mess up. Take a deep breath and remember, if we consider ourselves to be about the business of God, we want to pull them to the side and try to help them up, not beat them down. And when we are the ones who are caught up, we're going to need somebody to come by us and help us up and not beat us down. The greatest opportunity to lose somebody from the fold is to deal with them as if we ourselves can never mess up. When we read the stories about Jesus dealing with the lost sheep, the shepherd never says, ha, ah, tough on you. The shepherd never even says, you dumb sheep, you shouldn't have done that. No, the shepherd goes after to save. So the Greek word mock, you know, God is not mock. You've seen that before. Uh, it's related to the idea of nose. It can't be translated. Don't turn your nose up at somebody who needs help. Even when they've done wrong, they don't need us to turn up our nose. They need to help. And then we talk about things that make us grow tired. We can grow weary when it talks about helping one another carry a load. Bible talks about bear one another's burdens. So that's a load. That's a load that's about to make somebody buckle his or her knees. And the command is to keep on bearing. I got a typo there, but keep on bearing. But you sometimes do get tired of that, right? <laughs> you get tired. You know, I helped you with this load before. And we gonna get this together. We gonna pick up your own load. You know, can't you lift some weights or whatever? You get tired of that. We get tired of that. But remember that this is a one another thing, which means that we're going to need somebody to help us too. And we, if, if you say, well, never me, keep living. Keep living. And, and, and it's coming back. It's coming back. So we, we need that. Let, let each one of us help the other bear his or her burden. Now, remember. When it comes time for judgment, we will have to stand on our own record. That's verse five, right? Each will have to bear his own load. So while we're helping one another and all to continue helping one another and, and, and we get frustrated, we get tired, we got to keep on helping one another. But then that doesn't mean that you enable people. There's a difference between helping and enabling. Look, parents are learning this the hard way. If you got a child that is 64 
and still coming home looking for lunch money, you've enabled that job. And that, that didn't need you to reach in your pocket at age 25 and say, here, let me give you some more lunch money. No, you probably need to do something else then. Even birds know when chicks have to need to leave the nest. Uh, so each has to bear his own burden. So we're not talking about a teaching that tells us we got to enable people, you know, pick them up on our shoulder and carry them all day long. But we are talking about helping. And then we got to remember that God is gracious, but he does tell us, you, know, you do reap what you sow. And there are consequences that people will have to deal with, even when we're trying to help. And so let's look very quickly. There's the human factor. We can become weary by the human factor. Uh, and this is when people need stuff. Look, it's great. You got a house. Even greater if you own it outright. Car, but whatever. It's great. Wonderful, beautiful, uh, but there are not too many of us who can deal with missing too many paychecks. Uh, the economy being shaky, we haven't gotten our budget straightened out yet. We've got debt ceiling problem. Uh, folks can be hurting a lot quicker than they know if things were to turn wrong. So they, we can't get weary over the human factor. Just because things aren't uh, bad for me right now, doesn't mean that I should get frustrated with you because life happened to you. So we, we, we have to be mindful of this. At times, uh, these things happen to us. Uh, you can have ingratitude or ungraciousness, ungraciousness. Uh, the, I, the, 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 idea, the, I, the idea of people who think we owe, you get frustrated by that, right? You want to help? You're trying to help. I don't think there's any worse feeling than trying to help another brother or sister or somebody who's not in Christ. And they give you that look like, is that all you're going to do? That can make you weary. I was a young boy when one of our church members years ago had a house fire. Thankfully, nobody was injured. Uh, the, the church got together. And I remember it very well. They uh, did a lot to bring the house back up to speed. This cat had a nerve to start talking about the quality of stuff that was being put back in the house. Yeah, wait a minute, man. We could have let you out in the alleyway. So that can make you weary when people act that way. Uh, even when we talk about this human factor. The battle of getting tired of those who certainly want to use us. There are people who want to use us. There are people who want to use Jesus. Uh, remember? Met them. They felt... Uh, Filled bellies, uh, and then he went and started teaching them something else. Uh, he told them, look, basically, I'm the son of God. They said, well, look, show us a sign. Dude, you just ate to your belly's full, and you want a sign? And there are a lot of people who are that way. They just want to use us. And Jesus said, you just follow me for food. So that can make us weary because we are human, <laughs> and we can, we can get frustrated with that. So let's remember the promise as I wrap this up tonight. Don't grow weary when you're helping one another. West is a small church, but it needs a lot of help. Larger churches have even more help needed. The more people you have, the more opportunity you're going to have to get frustrated in helping. So we got to remember, we don't need to grow weary. We don't need to faint. The idea of fainting is when you give up and you just, you're done with it. The struggle for you and for me is to not lose heart, not to get sick and tired and give up because we don't see any positive results. Some people take a longer time to quote, be converted than others. If you've been around the church long enough, I think you understand that. We can't give up on it. Look, if every preacher gave up, because the church wouldn't grow forward spiritually, we probably wouldn't have any today. Every elder gave up under circumstances. We, we probably wouldn't have any today. Thank God he doesn't give up. And then we will reap 
Christian faithfulness not only helps us feel good because we've done the right thing, but we have an ultimate reward coming in heaven if we don't give up. So the challenge for each and every one of us is to remember that despite all of our diligent efforts, harvest time only comes in God's time. Don't give up on circumstances where people need help. Don't give up on people, whether they've slipped, transgressed the Lord, or whether they're in need of our physical, financial, material help. And that is our lesson for tonight. I hope that it has been somewhat helpful, if not more than that. And at this point, I'm going to give you an opportunity to share any thoughts you might want to share tonight. Brother Brown, this was a very helpful lesson, and I really do appreciate it. And I would like for you to show the slide before this one that you had up, if you don't mind. Can you do that? Yes, that one. Thank you. Certainly, certainly. Anybody else like to share a comment? Yeah, that's why it's so good. It's so good when we have these these families gatherings together because you really get a chance to know one another. Because you know, after service, a lot of people just leave, but when they're at that gathering, you get to learn, learn, you get to know that person. And then you can tell more of what they need and what they don't need because they'll speak that way. Very good one. Anyone else? Yes, I have a question. So uh, I understand the not growing weary part. How do we, I guess, if there's a if there's not a limit or if there is, how do we know? <laughs> The difference, uh, to distinguish the difference, like you, like you know, when you're trying to do, write about certain situations, whether it's yourself or somebody else, and then you, I guess, like, you know, you find you, you find yourself at your own expense, kind of like, the like how you saying the part where, you, uh, lest you get tempted, like you know, you're helping to a point where it's it's starting to, be at your expense. Like, what would you do then? He's, yeah, know, yeah, maybe, be clear, we're talking about money, right? Or something material? Uh, you can use it as an example. I'm just saying as far as like, if you're trying to help someone or something and it starts to mess with what you have going on as far as like with your walk or something like that, Very good how do you still be... Yeah, that's a great question, brother. That's a great question. And uh, let, me let me touch on that in a couple of different ways. If it's starting to impact you to weaken you, you might need to roll, you might need to raise up a little bit. Uh, raise up a little bit, call on some others to help you, uh, yeah. and get yourself refreshed, if you will. Uh, and and I mean I, I'll, I'll I'll speak it from a personal experience in being in, in ministry. You can get to the point where now, for lack of a better way of saying it, and brother, you starting to bring me down, and yeah, my, battery, yeah. my battery drained. Uh, but what's been, what's been helpful for me is to get with someone else who has refreshed me, and and then I'm able to come back and deal with it. So we, we have to know where our gas needle is and be careful not to get on E. Uh, and that practically means I, I might have to back up for a minute and um, just get myself together, if you will. Uh, and, and then I'm gonna come back to it and, and try to help. And if I find myself overwhelmed, now I really need to not only back up, but I need to pull somebody else in too to help me deal. And in that, some some cases may be where you need to you need to do do WWF or WWE, you know, on the on on the on the tag team. Uh, you might have to go to the corner and slap hands with somebody, have them come in and and take a round. <laughs> so there are ways that we can try to make sure we're taking care of our own spiritual health as well. Amen. So, I agree. 
so distance wouldn't be a bad thing? It, no, okay. no. You know, because if you look at the verse again, I'm, I'm at the first two verses. So there's a negative statement here. Uh, the idea of you, 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 you score such to one in a spirit of gentleness. The, the warning is keep watching yourself uh, so you don't become arrogant. Uh, because if you become that way, you can be tempted. That's a negative of, a thing, right? That's saying basically do it in the right spirit. But what is also implied is the need to receive as well as to give. So you have the one another, you bear one another's burden. I might get burdened in trying to help unburden somebody else. Yeah. So yeah. I need to go to someone else. Hey, uh, time for you to tap in here and, and, and get that. I need to get that break. I need to get that refreshing. And then I'm coming back. So it's not a bad thing to be aware of your own spiritual condition. It is a bad thing to be only aware of your own spiritual condition to the point where you never consider anybody. And Brother Brown, this is Belinda. I agree with you 100% because sometimes people like to take advantage of your kindness and they keep taking advantage and keep taking advantage. And it's almost like you're getting burned out or worn out or whatever and it's good to tag team with somebody or to discuss it because you end up saying even the wrong thing and sometimes you may have to go to that person and talk to them when you see that also yeah yeah but Very most of all pray means. about it exactly that the one another the one another's in scripture amazing this one another is so important they all are but yeah that's that's yeah i'm, I'm getting drained I've got to get some help here or I'm going to be of no help to you. Uh -huh. What do they tell us about trying to help somebody who's drowning? Don't they tell us if the person out there drowning is doing all that, if you're not careful, two people are going to die that day. Uh -huh. So we would need somebody else. Hey, Life raft or life boat, or whatever, life, whatever those donuts are. Somebody toss one of these in because we both about to go down. <laughs> one another part is very important. Brother okay. Brown, that yeah. falls that falls under the where you was explaining to us about enabling. Because yeah. you yeah. you can you can help somebody to the point where you're enabling them is bringing down what you've got going on. That that falls under where you explained that, right? Yes, sir, Charles, Brother Charles, that's right. Uh, enabling, picture enabling is, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep going for this person who won't even try. Right. You know, if, if you and I happen to uh, encounter a situation where somebody's not even trying you you can't help a person who doesn't doesn't you know here's a person with perfectly good legs and but they, they're tired of walking uh and you all right I'm, come on hand on my shoulder let me let me help you and they jump in your lap <laughs> you're not going to be able to help that individual you're going to have to look you got you got to do something you got to help us you, you got to help out so there's a need for us not to enable, but to help. Mm -hmm. Well, time is about gone tonight. We haven't even asked a prayer request and don't want to not do that. Uh, definitely want to give you an opportunity to ask for or permission any prayer request that you have tonight. Do we have any prayer requests this evening? Yes, I would like to ask for prayers for my granddaughter. She came to church about a month ago with, with her mom, my oldest daughter. Uh, her name is Araya, A-R-A-Y-A, Araya Taylor. She's suffering from a bad case of pneumonia. Yeah. They checked her for COVID. She doesn't have COVID. They checked it to see if it was her sinuses and it wasn't her sinuses. But it's a bad case of pneumonia and it's affecting her breathing. 
Okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, Brother Brown, pray for my dad. Um, he has a real bad sinus infection. They did test him for COVID, and, uh, but uh, he's not feeling well at all. So, you know, when he's not moving, you know, he's sick. So, just pray for him. And also, uh, we have a friend, uh, Carolyn Jackson. She's in the hospital. She has infections in her legs, and she also suffers from MS. So, keep her in your prayers. Anyone else? I have a prayer request for Obi. He's been having some issues today. Um, so let's pray for him and um, that he gets over the things that are bothering him and stressing him out mentally. Amen. Anyone else? I'd like that church to uh, pray for my sister. Uh, she lives in Dallas, and you know, Dallas is going through a lot of stuff with these shootings and uh, gun violence and things of that nature. She's a school counselor, so she's she's in the, the education system, and she deals with a lot of uh, kids in kind of um, hard households. And she is dealing with, well, her school is dealing with a student, you know, raised in a racist household, and he's been making a lot of threats and things of that nature and none of that stuff's nothing to be taken lightly so keep keep her in your prayers do you have any others if not let's let's talk to the lord about these situations tonight uh would you please bow with me? father in heaven we're grateful that you are a god of grace you're a God of healing, you're a God of protection, provision. You're a God of everything we need in this life. Oh, yes. Father, we pray tonight for Brother Charles' granddaughter as she is dealing with pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Please touch her young body and restore her to health and strength. Please, Lord. Bless her, Lord, to receive the treatment she needs, yes. the care she needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Care for her in a very special way. Be with our brother Terry Gordon, Lord. We pray that you might nurse him back to good health and strength. Yes, yes. Lord, see him through this infection. Bring them back to the health and strength he needs to have and bless him to get the rest he needs. Continue to care for him in a mighty way. Yes. yes. Look over at Carolyn Jackson as she deals with these problems with her legs. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Mindful of her in a mighty way. Bless and restore yes. her body to good health and strength. Yes. Dear Lord, be with Obi as he's facing some challenges right now. Pray that you might yes, calm his mind, uh -huh. settle his spirit, mm -hmm. allow him to be able to fight through and be victorious in dealing with the current challenges he's facing. Yes, Lord. Then we yes. pray for Devonair's sister as she's in a dangerous situation. Uh -huh. Please be mindful of her, Lord. Bless her to be able to overcome. Yes. Thank her, keep her safe. And Lord, just yes. give her wisdom as she deals with the circumstances she faces. Please Lord. be with all of these and all the other needs that weren't mentioned tonight. And mm -hmm. work in a mighty way to bring about the blessings that each one stands in need of. Thank you for loving us and being patient with us for your grace, for your mercy, for your long suffering. We ask that you help us to be long suffering with each other, gracious toward each other, living in this spiritual family in the way that you call us to live. Keep us in care throughout this night. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, people, you know what we do. Hey everybody. Hey everybody. Hey everybody. Hey, everybody. hey folks. <laughs> hey, bro.